eat clean food, drink clean water, silence your mind, do what you love. If you do what you love, you will emanate a frequency and an essence that brings you so much clarity in your life. Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic portal for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and I'm super excited about meeting Dr. Espen Jonby today. Dr. Espen is Norwegian, but he's living in Australia, and he is a researcher of neuroscience and quantum physics. He's a master healer, and he's a business mentor, helping people use the power of their consciousness to turn obstacles into opportunities. Let's meet Espen. Hello, Espen. How are you doing today? I am amazing. Excited to be here and looking forward to having an awesome conversation. Me too. You know, I just recently discovered you and it was sort of ironic because it was um, a teacher from South Africa that recommended you and she said, he's Norwegian and I hadn't heard of you. But then I realized that you're pretty big in Australia. You're not operating in Norway. Still, it was nice to like communicate a bit in uh, Norwegian because you come from Arendelle, that magical place from Frost, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So I would yeah. love to hear a bit about your story from how you got into the wellness business, how you got interested in quantum physics, and you're basically changing lives. I've seen clips from your seminars, and it's really, really uh, motivating to watch you. You're like full of energy, and it seems like you're helping so many people. How did you get into this? I think like so many people in the world, it's very often our traumas and our challenges that drive us towards finding solutions and answers. So for those of you out there uh, watching and listening, I'd like you to take this moment to consider uh, what it is in your life that's been a major challenge or an obstacle. Because obstacles can do one out of two things. They can literally make you or break you. And what I mean by that is that you can, you can choose to see obstacles in two different ways. And when there's a challenge that takes place, many people ask the question, why did that happen to me? And when you use that kind of language, it's, it's uh, placing yourself in a position of being uh, that of a victim that something has happened to. But if you perhaps believe that you are a spirit or a soul or more than just a physical self, then you may choose to change the question from why did that happen to me to how is this happening for me? Um, and either way, the, the circumstance is the same, the challenge, the obstacle, the, the, the drama, the trauma, whatever is the same, but the outcome is going to be different. So for me, uh, what I did in my life growing up in, you know, with a fair bit of challenges and trauma, um, having some, some obstacles in my life, I, when I learned this, I had to redo so many of the things that I had done in life. And I changed the question, how did that happen for me? What am I supposed to learn? What's the blessing in disguise here? What's the angel in, in disguise here? Um, and when I realized that my pit and my challenges, um, for those of you watching and listening, writing down the question, how did that happen for me? How did that challenge serve me, help me grow or, or push me into who I am today? Many people wouldn't go back and, and change it. So for me, the reason why I'm, I'm specializing in personal development in science and spirituality and combining those for people is because I had challenges in my life. And the only way I was able to overcome those challenges and rise to a higher level was through personal development, through science and through the, the spirituality of consciousness. So I grew up in a, a little town in Norway called Arendelle, um, the same movie that uh, the same town that the movie Frozen is based on. And when I was five years old, um, I woke up in the morning to a horrendous scream. Um, I knew it was my mother, something had happened. And so as a five-year-old um, child, I, I ran into my brother Kevin's room where the screams were coming from. And when I um, entered his bedroom, I saw my mom leaning over his bed and just continuously screaming. And it was in that moment that I realized that my brother Kevin had passed away. Um, he died in his bed that night as a, as a little baby. Um, and to, for me to see that as a five-year-old boy, I, of course, created a lot of trauma. Um, and then my mom tried to recover from this. She tried to heal. She tried to do her very best as a single parent, um, but didn't um, go 
all that well. So she started having, you know, uh, problems with alcohol and, and other types of abuse. And so for me growing up in a, what many will call an abusive environment, I had to be, um, I had to be tough and I started emotionally shutting myself down. Um, and what I mean by that is that sometimes when we're hurt, uh, you mentioned, mentioned so beautifully before that, yeah, later you might be able to see it and, and understand it. But in the moment when there's heartbreak, heartache, when there's grief, sorrow, uh, sadness, anger, illusion, desperation, you've lost something, um, whatever, particularly now in these COVID times, like so many people are losing their businesses and many other types of relationships and all sorts of things. In the moment when it takes place, because we are so overwhelmed by this thing that we call emotion, when we feel so emotional, we can't see the situation clearly. Um, and so, it, yes, it does take some time. But for me, growing up, I was suppressing these emotions um, because I didn't want to feel them, because I didn't have, you know, channels like yours where people can go to for solutions and, and help um, and, a, and a community of people that could assist in this. I didn't have that. So I started suppressing my emotions and shutting the emotions down. Um, and then, you know, of course, I was <laughs> overactive in the masculine strong in the brain, strong in the body, weak in the emotion and, 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 a, and a shut off or, or closed off heart. And as I got older, I started realizing that I had emotionally bypassed, that I hadn't sat with the feeling. I hadn't felt what I needed to feel. I haven't done the work. I haven't allowed myself to be vulnerable. Um, and that's a key, a really, really important key for those listening allowing yourself to be seen, to be heard, and to be vulnerable. Um, so the traumas happened. Over time, I was able to learn and continue to, so beautifully, just invest in yourself. If you make personal development a hobby, you will never be able to look back at your life the same. It'll always evolve. It'll always improve. And you'll start to see how magical life truly can be and that's what personal development um and and the combination of science and spirituality did for me thank you for sharing that and and i know that it didn't stop there like you went to australia uh to work and you actually got into an accident and it seems like the universe w tested you further uh i don't know if you know, the universe is really testing us, uh, but it seems like your soul wanted you to grow even further and go deeper down because you ended up in a hospital and you got an affection. And I, I, I was thinking when I realized that and did research on you, what's the odds of that, you know, going <laughs> to a hospital and that get a deadly infection? That, that's, that's horrendous. And then how did you manage to heal from that? It's a great question. Um, I always say the greater the challenge, the greater the hero. You know, God never sends great challenges to small soldiers. So it's very often you see that those people in life who have gone through difficult times and that have given themselves permission to feel that and to heal from that, they're very often the ones who appreciate life the most. Because if you look to the sky, you cannot see the stars without the darkness. The old metaphor of uh, of, of understanding that within the human experience, we have to have this duality of fear and love, uh, dark and light, day and night, good and bad, right and wrong, et cetera, the, the, the dichotomy of the, of the human experience. Um, so yeah, my, my brother passed. Um, my sister, two years later, was born disabled. Um, she's never walked, she's never ran. So I was raised uh, as the man in the house to help you know, with disability, et cetera. And then I came to Australia and I thought to myself, I, I wanted to continue my study. I was a personal trainer, nutritionist, and also a teacher at the time. Um, and I wanted to further my studies. And so I flew to Australia. Um, I got in only because I sent an email to every person in the faculty every day until they let me in. <laughs> <laughs> That's persistent. You know, yeah, well, persistence breaks down all resistance. If you want something in life, just don't stop. You know, as long as it's good for you, good for other people and good for the world, just don't give up on your dreams. If you want it, you've already created it. And so I flew to Australia, had an amazing couple of weeks. And then, of course, if you combine a, a young man with lots of testosterone um, who has suppressed emotions and an elevated ego <laughs> at the time, 
and put put that young man on a motorcycle uh, you know things don't always go so well so i was blessed by the universe with um with two broken legs and a fractured back and then in hospital yeah the um the the surgeon at the time had a really bad habit of not wanting to sterilize so he did the surgery on me without sterilizing his hands and as such i got a life-threatening infection um i was um, fighting for my life for almost two and a half years in and out of surgeries wheelchairs hospitals and um and that was a really dark time that was a really uh, interesting and challenging time and then you had sort of a spiritual experience, it seemed like. I, I could hardly believe what I heard. I, I saw this on a video where you actually just decided that if I'm going to heal, it's going to me, be me doing it. And you just left the hospital. Yeah. And, and, and let's be clear, like, it's not like I just left the hospital, you know, week one. I have I had been in and out of in and out of surgeries, hospitals, wheelchairs for a long, long time. We're talking almost a year. And th there's two. I, I want to be really clear here. For me, for me as a primary healthcare physician, it's really important that we understand that I, when I teach to my patients and my students, I always talk. There's two different, uh, two different types of, of uh, well, you can call it healthcare, but they're not actually healthcare. One is sick care, one's healthcare. Okay, and they both play a really important role. There is sick care and then there is health care. I'll give you an example. The average person wouldn't go to their medical doctor and say, hey, doc, can you please tell me about the newest research in nutrition and how I can optimize you know, my healing? The, the GP doesn't really normally specialize in that because they specialize in disease. So you'd go there with, with a disease or an ailment or you know, a broken finger or something. Um, similarly to that, you don't go to a healthcare specialist if you've if you've had a car accident. You go straight to hospital. So we have to understand that what we call healthcare is is actually not healthcare. In in the majority of cases, it's sick care because you don't enter the sick house sick house until you have been, you know, have some symptoms of, and you've been unwell. So for me, what I realized is the majority of the what we call healthcare system is actually a sick care system. And my value now as a physician, as a, an athlete, as a father, as a, you know, a person that teaches these things, my aspirations is not just to be okay or to, to kind of have an all right life. My aspiration is to be healthier um, next month and next year than I was last month and last year. So I'm 39, I'm much healthier than I was when I was 22. And this will continue for me because I'm continue, always looking into my mental, emotional, spiritual, chemical, uh, well-being, et cetera. So what I realized, which is so important for people to understand, is that if you wish to be well, then you must take a moment to look around you and ask, who is the, the wellness care team or the health specialist team around me where's my personal trainer and my nutritionist and my my coach and what kind of personal development am i doing am i meditating am i doing um detoxes am i drinking clean water am i taking care of my body mind and 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 emotions etc so it was really a massive shift and this is quite um, um groundbreaking for a lot of people because we go around in life and this is might be a bit confronting to some, but I'll share it because I think it'll really benefit people listening. We go around in life thinking that we're healthy because we don't feel any pain. Well, the question is, does the absence of symptoms mean that you are healthy? You know, I can have cancer and heart disease and diabetes at the same time. These are the three leading causes of death. I can have all of those at the same time and feel no pain. You see, health is not just how we feel, it's also how we function. So for me, when I recognized that I tried everything in hospital, they were, I was in and out of surgeries. They were giving me every drug that they could throw at it. Um, and with a staph infection, what's called an MRSA, a multi-resistant staph aureus infection, it's an infection that Unfortunately, in many countries, such as Australia, not as prevalent in Norway, Norway's got an amazing healthcare system, thank God. Um, the, the, the infection actually lives in hospitals in many cases. And so I got it from the hospital and then they pumped me full of even more drugs, um, which can be very useful um, for other uh, infections, but not for this one. 
And you see what it did is it was just reducing my immune system and making me sicker and sicker and sicker. And then there was this moment where the surgeon uh, walked in and he looked at his charts and he looked at me and he just went, <sighs> he said, the infection is spreading. And so at that time I had an infection that was going up my right hip all the way through my glutes into my groin. Um, and I had a, a, a metal pin that was 45 centimeters long that went down the whole thigh bone, the whole femur. And, uh, and he said, if, you, if the infection continues to spread, then, you know, in best case scenario, you lose your right leg from the hip and down. And in the worst case scenario, if the infection attacks your internal organs, well, then you die. So that was for me in that moment, a spiritual death. It was an ego death. Uh, it was an emotional death. And I, a voice came through. It was really, I had never heard anything like that before. I never experienced anything like it, hands down. It was mind blowing. And a voice came through and the voice literally just said, if it is to be, it's up to me. And what I mean by that, if it is to be, if it is to be, if healing is to be for me, it's up to me. <clears throat> and now I teach as a physician, I teach that I always say the doctor can dress the wound, but only you can heal. So, so think about this. If you break a leg, it's not the doctor that heals your leg. They can put a cast on or a pin through it, but they don't heal it. You do. If you get a cut, and I learned this from Dr. John Martini actually, that I know you've interviewed an amazing man. He said, if you get a cut, it'll heal itself. The doctor can dress the wound, but only you can heal. So the truth is that I was, and many listening might be able to resonate with this, I was looking outside of myself. Outside of myself. I always say those who go, those who don't go within, they have to go without. So I was looking at the, for the, sur uh, the surgeons and the nurses and the doctors and, and the drugs and all of these things outside of me to heal me, come heal me. And I tried, I tried for over a year. And don't get me wrong, modern medicine li changes lives, it saves lives. If it wasn't for it, they wouldn't have put me back together. But again, they were applying sick care when I needed health care. And so... I knew in my heart that something was wrong. I knew that I had to do things differently. And I knew that I couldn't depend on this system to heal me anymore. So I said, thanks, doc. When he said, you, you know, you lose your leg or you die, basically. I said, thanks, doc. And I left the hospital and never looked back. And that's when I started applying the things that I intuitively knew, not intellectually. You know, I've got three degrees in science and, you know, all these things and whatever else. But there wasn't in here now. It was in here now. And I just started doing the things that I intuitively felt I needed to do. Stop being caloric reduction, reduce the calories, stop putting toxins in your body. One of the keys to living a healthy life is reducing calories. So I started juicing, I started fasting, I started drinking water, I started doing breath work, yoga, meditation. Um, I started praying, praying. I don't know if anyone's um, religious, I'm not religious i'm spiritual but I, I have a conversation with the creator on a daily basis so i started doing all these wonderful things and in a matter of i think it was three and a half four weeks the, the wound i had a hole in my hip that was yeah leaking let's just put it up otherwise it sounds a bit disgusting for almost um, nine months just closed off and i had a fever for about half a day and voila i got two legs that is amazing Thank you for uh, sharing it and explaining it so, so so thoroughly, because it is just so inspiring to hear the power of the mind and commitment and dedication and power of going within, using our consciousness to heal. Uh, do you think that that voice was that uh, pivotal moment that made it all shift because I'm thinking about what if you didn't have that voice coming to you you know uh, because sometimes uh, I hear these stories where all of a sudden there was a voice it was this insight but sometimes we don't get that uh, for instance uh, my father was uh, in a hospital um, almost died in South Africa 
And I also asked him, did you have a near death experience? Have you experienced anything? Because it was in a coma. And he was like, no, nothing, nothing. <laughs> and I so yearned for him to have this insight because I couldn't heal him. Well, actually what we did was giving him a lot of love. And to be honest, uh, I do think that we helped the healing with just sitting there by his bed 24 hours. We sat there, we sat there and just sang for him, gave him, gave him love. But my point is many of us don't get these messages. So do you think that was really pivotal that you got that message? Or do you think that you would have healed nevertheless? If I did not take my health into my hands, and if that message didn't come through or a similar message uh, did not come through, then I think intuitively, I know I most likely would have been sitting here with one leg at the best. But I just want to emphasize this. <clears throat> the message, the voice comes in many different forms. Perhaps you listening to this right now, maybe this is your message. Maybe for those listening, we just need to turn our phones off and sit in silence for half an hour a night, half an hour a day. Just sit and feel and listen. And you will find the answers that you seek. They are found in stillness. They're not found in busyness. Um, so it's very often when you're waiting for something and or if you're attached to something, holding on to something, it doesn't always arrive until the time is right and, and you are ready to let go of those attachments. So yes and no. Um, messages, voices, signals, um, um, truth bombs are always there. It's a matter of silencing or quieting the mind and learning to, to, to hear and to sense them. I love that you said that because I think it's important because I think sometimes we are waiting for that signal and that voice and that uh, clear message on what to do. And some of us are not getting it like directly like that. However, we all have the capacity to go within and find our own answers. Uh, and I think again, like you're saying, not going out there, um, because many times we feel like, oh, I need to get go to a clairvoyant to get answers. Like, will this go well? But you have the answers within you. Because a clairvoyant yeah. will always filter the information through their system. I've come to realize, because I work with a lot of clairvoyants, it's always a filter there. So I think you'll get the most clarity from yourself from your inner being. And sometimes I think our soul wants us to not get it on the silver platter. It wants us to start doing the work and going within, and then it will reveal itself, right? Yes. If you ask for peace, you don't get peace. You get challenging circumstances for you to heal through so you can find peace and so on and so forth. So the, the messages are always there. Um, it's just that sometimes we're too busy uh, to sense them or um, we don't want to hear them because we may not be ready. And what I've found in, in science measuring, you know, we've helped over 4,700 people now through our programs and they have like gone through three days or 16 weeks or whatever and graduated eventually. And what we find is that the universe, call it um, source, consciousness, God, call it, you know, energy, call it whatever you want to call it, um, has a tendency to give us a little nudge. And there might be, you know, a challenging conversation. It might be something that comes up in your reality. And I call it the feather. It's like a little tickle. It's like, hey, Annika, here it is. Like, listen, are you listening? Are you listening? And then you don't listen. And then you get a, a little slap. So this, <laughs> this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor, of course. Universe goes, hey, there's a little nudge. And then the slap becomes a kick in the butt. And then eventually, if you don't do something about it, it can become, you know, a Mack truck. And that's when we wake up. So the key in essence, if you want to understand human consciousness and to be able to, to be present and to, to evolve as a spiritual being is to be able to see things as they arrive to assimilate energy as they arrive. Honestly, it is not rocket science. Eat clean food, drink clean water, silence your mind, do what you love. If you do what you love, you will emanate a frequency and an essence that brings you so much clarity in your life. Um, and just, um, just remember that 
as I say to every everyone, you are the hero that you've been waiting for. You are the hero that can change the world. And you just do that by living your life and living in joy. And when you do, you will be able to find the answers because your value system and how you feel will show the way. I'd love to dive, dive deeper now into your work. Um, you do or teach quantum living. And what is quantum living? <laughs> Great question. I'll give you an example. Um, for those you know, listening and watching, if it's safe to do so, just take a moment to look at your hand. Okay, so we look at our hand like this, and we can see that it's physical. It's flesh and bone. But if I put your hand under a microscope, and we look at the microscope, we're going to see a thing called the molecule. Okay, and then I go deeper with the microscope, and then I find a thing called an atom. Yeah, and in the middle of the atom, there's a thing called the nucleus. And so in science, if we use a microscope and we look at anything physical, it goes from molecule, atom, nucleus, and then sub, meaning below them, smaller than, um, sub levels of nature's function. And so if we put any part of the human body under a microscope and the microscope is good enough and we look in this microscope, we can see which has now been proven for over a hundred years in quantum physics or quantum mechanics, the study of subtle energies, the study of possibilities, we will see that all of us are actually made up of 99.9 .9 and then eight more nines. So 99.9999999999 percent non-physical. So you and I and everyone listening are made up of 99.9% .9 pure space. And this is difficult for the average person to comprehend because you look in the mirror and you see physical. You, you feel your hand and you, and you feel physical. But you see the physical bits of matter, these particles of matter, these things that are physical in nature, they're held together by a specific energy frequency and vibration. So let's backtrack and just make this really simple. You're made up of 99.9% .9 space. Okay. And a very small percentage is physical. Within this space, there is a consciousness. There is an awareness. And if I was to ask you now, listening, watching all over the world, if I was to ask you to choose between two scenarios, there's no right or wrong answer, but choose between two scenarios. Scenario one is for you if you believe that you're only flesh and bone. So scenario one is if you believe that the children, the people that you love and yourself, you're only made up of the things that you can touch and feel and hold and see, and that's it. Nothing else exists. That's scenario one. Okay. And then we have scenario two, which is different. Scenario two is where we believe that we are a spirit or a soul or energy, some sort of consciousness, something more than just physical stuff. And for everyone listening right now, I'd like you to say either one or two. One, if it's only physical, and two, if it's physical, but more to you than just flesh and bone. And I'll tell you one thing really interesting. I haven't done this now with almost 5,000 um, graduates and almost 100,000 students in live rooms. 99% of people raise their hand and say, I believe that I am, a, I am a spirit, I am a soul. There is more to me than just flesh and bone. And you see that belief matches the scientific fact that yes, there is so much more to us than just physical. As Einstein said, there's only two ways to see life. One is that nothing's a miracle and two is that everything's a miracle. And the physical bits, yes, they're real, but they make up such a small fraction of who and what we are. So the question is, what would happen if we actually turned our attention back within to experience and explore the untapped quantum potential, the untapped godlike consciousness that we all are and have within? What would happen if we did that?
everything would change. And science supports it for over 100 years since Max Planck won the Nobel Prize for quantum physics and so on and so forth. So the quantum living component of what I teach um, is simply showing people that they have the power, the wisdom, and the beauty of the entire universe inside of themselves. And the only thing holding them back is themselves as well. Uh, even though we might know this, uh, I believe in this totally. Uh, and I've had an experience of it as well, like several spiritual experiences, but I find myself falling back to default a lot of the times and fall back to limiting beliefs of that is not possible. That is not possible because I haven't experienced it yet in my life. Um, is it then when, when we come to that realization that we are a spirit and the, the possibilities we have, is it the beliefs that are limiting us? Beliefs play a very important role. And in human psychology, one of the things that we talk about is a thing called the imprint period. And the imprint period is the age of one to seven years of age when the child is uh, born and starts to develop. Uh, the child, similar to the computer that you're on right now, has a program. And even though you and I open the, the laptop and press you know, on and the computer turns on, the, even though the only thing that we see on the screen is what's on the screen, there are thousands of processes happening in the background. Uh, the memory is doing its thing and the hard drive is doing its thing and the battery and the fan is doing their thing. So there's just thousands of things happening in the background. Now that is symbolic of what happens every day for us as humans, because 95% of our thoughts, our actions, our emotions, our habits, our beliefs, our limiting beliefs are unconscious. So they're in the subconscious mind and the way to heal through this and to overcome limiting beliefs or even optimize your current beliefs to that whatever the belief needs to be for you to live your best life that is simply a matter of looking into the unconscious and we have a very specific process of doing this it's kind of like walking into a dark room with a flashlight You've got a flashlight you can see in the dark so that flashlight represents the, the conscious mind entering the unconscious and having a look around and, and saying something like okay well what is my earliest memory um, of relationships um, what is my earliest memory we do this with our students uh, i get them to close their eyes and go back in time to the, their earliest memory of the conversation in the household around money and over 95 percent of our graduates again have an unconscious, seeded, imprinted condition, belief in their nervous system, in their body, in their brain, that money equals stress and fear and, and, and scarcity and lack. And unless we go back to the program, and just like computer coding, you have to rewrite a program. Unless we rewrite this program, which we do in personal development, in breakthrough, breakthrough exercises, et cetera, unless we can go back and actually observe the fact that the first time this trauma took place, you know, I was three years old, my mom uh, pushed my dad, he fell over, and so I was in fear, or they were having an argument about, around money, and now I'm still feeling the same around money. Whatever the trauma might be, we have to understand that we can go back in time and we can rewrite this program, change this belief from money is evil, you know, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, money equals fear, money equals stress, to money equals units of choice, money equals freedom. And I am worthy and I am worth it. And because I do so many good things for so many people, I receive money in exchange for that, for example. So... Beliefs play an important role, yes, and they're one of the many things that we that we work with. Um, but the question I would pose were, would be, where did this belief start? And when was the first time you experienced something in relation to this? How long has this belief been in your life? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? And what does the belief 
And for those of you watching and listening, you might want to go back and listen to this over and over and over again, because I'm saying things that are profound and could change your life, but you might need to actually think about these things. The third question is, what does this belief need to be in order for me to make the rest of my life the best of my life? So would you say it's inner child work that you go back, you meet that inner child that experienced this, and then you... What I'm interested in understanding is what you do in that process when you find that program. Uh, is it only awareness that, that you become aware that, oh, you know, my father and mother had an argument uh, and there was adultery or something uh, and you stopped believing in love? Is it um, enough to become aware of that and then decide as an adult I'm going to believe in my ability to attract a beautiful relationship or do you need to do some deep healing on it and affirm it again and again and sort of work with it several times because it might be stuck in your body in your whole energetic system that's right and I call that stuckness issues in the tissues okay <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's funny, but, you know, as a physician, I used to say to my patients, so you've got this, I'll give them a diagnosis, and then they believe that's something wrong with them. But all disease, all suffering um, is a lower vibration. So if you look up the Hawkins scale of consciousness, you look at energy, frequency, and vibration, like Nikola Tesla, um, you would see that when you feel good, the vibrations are high. When you're healthy, the vibrations are high. When you feel uh, procrastination, hesitation, frustration, desperation, depression, whatever it might be, the vibrations are low. So the answer to the question is both. And it depends on the level of trauma. Normally, if the trauma was intense, like painful and, and traumatic, and the imprint into the nervous system was, was powerful, it's not enough to be aware. The first step to self-mastery is self-discovery. The first step to anything that could be healed or transformed starts with, as you said, awareness. Because if you don't know it, you can't see it, you can't change it. So awareness and consciousness truly is your number one superpower. After observing it and understanding it, then it depends on how ingrained it has been. If it's been there for 40, 50, 60 years, for some people, it's not possible to shift it because they're just not willing to shift it. And some people feel like, you know, this makes me who I am. And so when I play these, these stories and, and, and I run this program, then I get attention and, you know, I can do behave in a certain way because of, you know, I ha that happened to me. Um, others can shift it super quick. Uh, for the majority of people, awareness, yes. And then we go back in time, we sit with it and we rewrite it. We, we feel the emotions that have not been felt. Uh, in, a, in a scientific, um, sacred um, uh, space, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a way that where people can actually trust the process and allow themselves to feel that again. Um, so it really does vary on the situation. Um, but if you're able to observe it first, and then the second thing that I would do is I would ask, is this pattern, is this belief, is this emotion, is this trauma still showing up in my life? Like you, you mentioned adultery. Okay, well, if that happened at a young age and, and you have a young lady or a young man in their 20s or 30s, normally when they've experienced adultery, if the mom cheated on the father or vice versa, you'd very often see the child having a problem committing to relationships and or attracting the wrong kind of people into their relationships because they haven't actually enabled themselves and allowed themselves to open up their hearts and be vulnerable. Because in their language, in the unconscious mind, opening up your heart and being vulnerable might mean that you become hurt like your mom or your father. And so there's, there's a lot to this, but in essence, that's the long answer. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I want to go a bit quantum here because um, I know you researched it. And what puzzles me <laughs> is that in the quantum world, there are infinite possibilities. And right. then I'm curious about our soul mission, 
having a sole purpose in life, a destiny. What uh, or how do the do these two go together from your perspective that we have infinite possibilities and then we might have a destiny and a blueprint and a purpose from a soul level. Holy moly. What a <laughs> <I know>. question. <laughs> Needed to be asked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, can you give me some context as to what you believe your listeners or, or viewers would want to achieve from, from that question? And I'll see which path we go. Yeah, I guess to me, it has been very helpful to know that I have a destiny, that I can sort of trust that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when there are infinite possibilities, that's great in one sense, uh, but I can also fail. Uh, what if it's not meant to be that I'm going to do this? Uh, it can uh, be a bit more scary that anything can happen. Uh, if mm -hmm. I have a feeling that I, I will one day get an amazing uh, relationship, it's in my destiny. I will meet the woman in my life or the man in my life. And one day I will really live my purpose and feel at home with what I'm doing because it's part of my destiny. So it gives hope, I feel like. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if it's too constricted, it can limit a bit, you know. Uh, but to me, it has given uh, me hope. And I think there are a lot of people who also can find hope that I'm destined to do something great. I'm destined to have a great life. Mm, phenomenal. Great question. So this, uh, the best way I can teach this is to teach you the true, uh, the true secret of manifestation. So I think many people have seen, yeah, this, this, this <laughs> stuff. I, I was, I, I was got so excited. <laughs> I know this, when I got this, this changed the game for me. I, I was trying to manifest in the old ways for 15 years. And believe you me, I worked my butt off. I worked harder than anyone I knew. I was more dedicated than anyone I knew. And still, I was, I was not able to manifest what I was hoping to achieve. I think many people out there can relate to this. You, you, you work hard. You, well, you want to find that special someone, but you feel like they're not there. You want to make more money or be successful in business, but you just you have not been able to do it. You want to actually feel the happiness on the inside, the fulfillment on the inside, but you haven't been able to. You want to be healthy. You want to stay healthy, but you still don't have, you know, you still don't have that outcome. And so first things first, principle number one, awareness. Principle number two is you are the only thing standing in your way. Okay, so if we can get that out of the way, if we can be honest enough and vulnerable enough to say, yes, okay, things have happened, but I am responsible for my life and no one's going to come into my reality and fix it for me. If it is to be, it's up to me. So if we can just establish that first, then the next question is, okay, I got that, but where to from here? What is the true, the true secret? Of manifestation. I'll tell you a secret, uh, a really cool way to explain this. Um, I'm sure you've heard of an incredible man by the name of Dr. Wayne Dyer. Many people watch, are watching and listening. If you haven't looked him up, phenomenal philosopher, um, great teacher, really beautiful man. I interviewed, uh, Dr. His, uh, I interviewed his daughter, Serena Dyer. Beautiful, oh, beautiful woman. Yeah. Perfect. They they wrote a book together before he died. A beautiful, uh, I think it's called Don't Die with the Music Within You. She wrote with Wayne, yeah. That's one of the oldest quotes in personal development. Mm. Just sing your song, live your life. Anyway, when we try to manifest something uh, and let's use the example of, I want to manifest more money in my life. That's a really common one that a lot of people are trying to. And it could be, I want to be healthy. I want to um, be happy, whatever it is. What we do is we use one of the two parts of the formula. And the problem here is that we are then not able to manifest what we're hoping to achieve. So let's take a, a step back. In science, 
if we look at you and do a scan of your body, we're going to see that you're made up of electromagnetic fields. So yes, you are physical, primar primarily non-physical as we've talked about, but there is a thing that you are that emanates from your heart space, which is called the torus field, T-O-R-U-S, or the toroidal field. Now this is a, a bioenergetic field, an electromagnetic field. Okay, the earth is an electromagnetic being. It has a North Pole and a South Pole. A battery is just the same, it has a plus and a minus. So if you and I look at a battery and has two pluses, are we gonna get any electricity out of it? Are we gonna get any power out of it? None. If you have two negatives, you're gonna get any power out of it? None. Similarly, we are electromagnetic beings. So there is an electric component and a magnetic component. The electric component is the thought. So the thought can be, I want to make a million dollars. Okay. Then there is the magnetic component, which is the emotion. So it's not the thought, it's the feeling. Now, here's the key. Most people <laughs> would say something like, and I'll check in with you guys if you're listening and, and, and watching, who's ever done something like this before? It goes like this. You want to manifest something? You want to use the law of attraction, right? It goes like this. I want a million dollars. 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 <laughs> and we do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And we wonder, why is it not working? Perhaps because you're uh, doing it from the sense of lack. Exactly. Now check this out. When you look at the, the movie, The Secret, for example, Wayne Dyer was asked to be a part of the movie, The Secret, but he said no. And the reason he turned it down, I'm not saying don't watch it. I'm saying go watch it because the, the law of attraction is a real law. There are 12 universal laws, ladies and gentlemen, 12 universal laws. They're just like gravity. If you don't believe in gravity, you, you jump off the roof, you're still going to hit the ground because it's a law. These are 12 a very important universal laws. And most people don't have any idea what they are. So we live lives outside of these parameters, which makes it incredibly difficult to manifest. Nonetheless, Wayne Dyer was asked to be a part of the movie The Secret, and he said no. Uh, and he said, it's not, he said, I didn't decline it because the law of attraction isn't real. He said, I declined it because it's a half truth. When I heard this, I thought to myself, that is interesting. And I started doing the research and, and several months I was just researching and researching. And then again, like I came upon the universal laws and then I understood it. Now let's get this right. The thought is an electrical signal. It's considered a masculine part of, of the equation, if you will. And it goes something like, I want a million dollars, I want a million, million dollars. So the thought is the intention, but the feeling is something like, shit, I'm struggling to pay my bills. Or I'm not worthy of being wealthy. And here we have the dichotomy. Here we have the problem. Because most people want this and want that but they haven't done the work to raise their emotions. I always say the feeling is the healing. And even research through the Heart Math Institute that was able to prove that the, the magnetic field of the heart is 5,000 times, 5, times more powerful than the magnetic field of the brain. And let me ask you, what does a magnet do? It draws things to it. It attracts. So when we're going around decade after decade saying, I want a million dollars, I want to be healthy, I want to be wealthy, I want to have a beautiful relationship, I want to be happy. And the thought is, I want a million dollars, but the feeling is, I am afraid because I don't feel safe. What we're attracting, the feminine aspect, the emotional aspect, the feeling aspect, the magnet. 
which is 5,000 times more powerful, attraction-wise, is what you attract. So what you want to attract is what you set out to attract. What you attract is how you feel. And that's the secret. And that's where I'd like to quote uh, the late, great Dr. Wayne Dyer when he said, and I quote, and you might want to write this down if you're listening. He said, you do not manifest what you want. You manifest what you are able to become. And I'd like to add and sustain vibrationally. When you're vibrating at a frequency where you feel good, where you feel love, where you feel connection, where you love your job, where you take care of yourself and, and you express yourself and you are able to, to fall in love with yourself again, not in an ego way, but in, a, in, a, in an authentic way. And you are able to raise the emotion to match the thought. So in other words, I want a million dollars. I feel like a million dollars. I want that special one to come into my life. I feel that I'm worthy of love. I want to be healthy. Well, I already feel healthy. And then someone might say, hang on, I don't know, no, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, that's all right. You, I've been through some things. Don't, don't get me wrong. But if I focus on the painful shoulder and the headache and the, the sore toe and the stomach problems and this and that, if I focus on that, that's what I get. But if I was to spend every day saying thank you to 10 body parts for carrying me my whole life, with the knowing and the understanding that what I cultivate gratitude for, I shall, I shall surely be blessed with more to be grateful for. If I did that, if I focused on that, I would get that and I would have that. And when I feel that, I would receive that. So again, the science of gratitude, it's not just a thought. It's matching the thought that the masculine, the electrical with the feeling, the feminine, the magnetic. And when there is coherence between the positive, the negative, the masculine, the feminine, the electro and the magnetic, there is coherence. And when there is coherence within the energetic field, you are able to attract according to that vibration. That makes a lot of sense. And I love that you really explained that thoroughly. Uh, I think it's so important. And I think there is a raising awareness around that, that when the secret came out, everybody was like, yeah, I'm going to test it. And and then it was like, it's not working. And then more and more information came forward about like, what, what about the feelings? And I love yeah. how you said that that is the more feminine. I, I didn't think about that. And also that that has a stronger pull uh, because it's coming from the, the, the heart and the electromagnetic field around the heart. And so mm -hmm. it seems like then the, the feelings are, are more important. Uh, and you also mentioned living as if. Uh, the thought I got was maybe manifestation comes then later down the road that we need to start with our personal development first before we start to manifest. Because if we're coming from this place, oh, I'm not worthy and starting to try to manifest, it won't work, right? Or, or we'll attract where we are at. So it seems like we need to grow first and then manifest what are your thoughts on that spot on the best manifestation is personal development spiritual evolution advancing your level of consciousness and, and, and love and service to yourself and others so that is the level that you're attracting it um, so honestly when you look at it and we observe it for what it is we are scientifically proven again the creators of our reality so when we understand that we are not just flesh and bone, we are, I guess you could say, spirit souls having a human experience. I, I always say I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. Um, when we recognize this, and in, in quantum science, when we observe something, and this is critical, when I observe something, if I look at you, um, and I look at you with, with grace and with, with appreciation, um, there is going to be a change in your energy signature based on how I observed you. So this goes back to Dr. Emoto's work in Japan uh, when they had water and they would talk to water and they would say, I hate you and you're ugly. And they say a lot of negative things to the water. They would take pictures of the water 
and then uh, freeze the water and take pictures of it. And they would observe it. And the way the molecular structure, the way it froze was completely different to when they would say to water, I love you, you're so beautiful, and so on and so forth. So they were able to prove that the way we express something, the way we talk to people, the way we talk to ourselves, the way we um, believe what is happening creates that reality within our, within our lives. So the truth is that everything around us is a reflection, a mirror of our own level of consciousness. Now, what this means, it, we talk manifestation, if I want to attract this, attract that. Yes, the, the only place to start is within. So when we looked at this in, in quantum physics, there's a, there's a thing called the observer effect. And I won't go too much into the scientific geek, geeky things, but the observer effect uh, in a thing called the double slit experiment, S-L-I-T, says that what you are observing, what you are looking at, what you are focusing on changes. It changes based on how you observe it. So then in essence, if we want to create something, we have to start with the way we are observing life and the way we, what we are placing attention on. Um, and, and we are then able to create something different based on how we're observing it. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking about synchronicities in my life, how I have experienced that as true and real. It's just examples like I write to a teacher uh, asking them about the collaboration. And then somehow, uh, th this happened the other day, I got like a, a pin back, like a magazine had written about that teacher and then linked to my former uh, earlier interview with that person. And that happened in the same day or that I remember in the relationship I was in, um, I felt that, oh, now it's over. I'm not having contact. I don't feel him in my field. And then all of a sudden I started thinking about him and then I got a message and all of a sudden we met by accident on the street and stuff like that. And by accident. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost like I can feel sometimes that a person is coming into my field. And, and it's interesting, is that person thinking about me or am I thinking about them? Like who is sending the message and who is the receiver? But it's, it's really real. And I think I, I know Deepak Chopra has a story about that he needed to get in touch with a person that was in another country. There was a, an emergency and he couldn't reach her on telephone or email. So he sat down and was like sending messages and she picked up the phone and she was like, I just felt I needed to contact you. So these things are, are very real. Uh, it's, it's really magical that we can use our consciousness much more conscious and not to manipulate, but to use that divine power that we have and you also speak about that we have a divinity within us and i think it's about honoring that not using it but uh, uh you know as power but honoring that as we are divine creatures who are part of the universe and the way i see it is that you know the creator is us all that we are just parts of the creator uh, you can almost say that we are gods, everybody are gods, because we are creating, we're just part of the same thing. And when we start to see God in each other, that's, I think, when we start to see the truth of who we are. So, but we forget that in our humanness and in our COVID and fear and all that stuff, we forget about that. And this is why, honestly, my dear, that um, channels like yours are literally changing the planet because every person that listens will remember something, observe something, feel or experience something that will bring them a little bit closer to their own divinity if they choose to allow that to happen. Um, on the note um, of COVID, um, it is really important. Einstein said there's only two emotions. All other emotions are derivatives of these two emotions. And they are, of course, fear and love. Um, fear on the Hawkins scale of consciousness vibrates at 100 hertz. Okay, so that's 100 oscillations, 100 per second. Uh, love 
is 528 hertz. Um, when you are placing your attention on fear, you will um, unfortunately, drastically, dramatically, quickly and profoundly reduce your immune system, your reproductive system, your cognitive function, your imagination, your creativity, um, your heart starts to close off, your posture begins to lean forward, and you become um, stuck in survival. So as vital as it is, and, and, and I based my life on, on research and science, so let me say this gently, as, 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 it, as vital as it is to stay informed, it is very, very, very important to be very particular with what you place your attention on. Because if you're placing your attention on something that's continuously bombarding you with fear, you will unfortunately have those similar biophysiological uh, effects in your body. So stay informed with what's happening in the world, but maybe be, be a bit more uh, uh, conscious as to what you watch on TV as to what you watch, what you listen to, and what kind of conversations that you have in your reality. Because if they're about death and sickness, death and sickness, death and sickness, death and sickness, guess what you're creating? So take a step back, know that you're safe, play it smart, stay informed, but be very, very, very conscious of what you're listening to and what you're feeding your mind. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's the, my number one rule at the moment because there's so much sensationalism out there that if you were to look at some things that we would continuously be, ah, and you can't create, you can't bring divinity from a space of survival. Mm -hmm. And we are not meant to be in survival 90% of the time, as many people are at the moment, but in a really small, uh, small period, uh, percentage of time. Um, I want to touch on synchronicities if, uh, if I have permission. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Because you mentioned before, like I was thinking about him and then he texted me. Okay. Now I know many people listening will have similar experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does that work? Okay. Well, let me give an example. I call this one the spiral of synchronicities. When you understand that you are a spiritual being having a human experience, you are a soul that is not bound by space or time in the body where we're separated physically. But together, the 99.9% .9 of the consciousness is beyond space and time. So for example, you and I are connected um, and I have met you and I think of you and the way I think of you is the way you'll be affected um, through sending that energy out to someone. Synchronicities are really important. And, and they're not important to, to do, but to pay attention to. Because if you're, we have a thing in our company and it happens so often in the beginning, our students come in and they do the three day event or whatever. And then they're like, oh my gosh, you won't believe what happened. Like I did this thing and then I thought about the guy and then he called me. And then I wanted to get this job. And then the next day, the boss, my boss called and I got the job. And in the beginning, you know, me and the facilitators will look at each other and, and we just go, oh, we do believe you actually, because this happens all the time. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. And then we have a thing. I just say whoop or they say whoop. And then everyone says, there it is. <laughs> because we're training our minds to pay attention to synchronicities. Now, synchronicity is not a synchronicity. It's not just random. It's, if, it, if it is a true synchronicity, it is, in my language, a spiritual sign that you're on purpose. So the way it works is, is, is really cool. When you are able to assimilate energy, which means that you are able to stay in a high frequency and connect to the things that you love. Now, let's be clear. Someone can love working on cars and being a mechanic is their purpose. Someone else can be a painter or a florist or like me, a, a teacher, a speaker, like you, an educator, and a, a person that inspires. You can be anything under the sun. A, a flower doesn't look at the other flower and go, oh, look at her. She's so beautiful. I'm just going to shrink. They both shine with no comparison. They both reach for the light and they both shine. 
And, and this is the essence of who we are. We should also shine. But somewhere along the line, someone came into your life and said, you can't do this, you're not good enough, and therefore you won't be loved. Someone said, no, 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 no. You're not going to work on cars. You're not going to be a poet. Go and, and be an accountant. And that's amazing if that person wants to be an accountant, but so often we don't. We don't want to do the things that we do. So what happens is when we are living lives outside of the purpose or the passion, when we are living lives, as Di Martini says, that are not aligned with our values, the universe will show us a lot of signs to bring us back on path. Einstein said, if you judge a, a fish by its capacity to climb a tree, it'll spend its entire life thinking that it's stupid. So fish is not designed to climb a tree. So the point that I'm making here when it comes to synchronicities is if you're out of sync, if you're not living your life, if you're living someone else's life, then the universe will normally show you, as I said, procrastination, hesitation, frustration, desperation, and depression. And you may think that there's something wrong with you, but what if the universe is to trying to teach you, to show you how to come back to living the path that is true you? And then those then that either do this already or will make the shift through the personal development and, and find themselves and find their truth as in, you know what? I'm going to be a kindergarten teacher. I'm going to be an author. I'm going to be a break dancer. I'm going to be whatever. Because that's what I love. When they start doing what they love and they're loving what they're doing, people can't wait to be around them because they shine. They have this, this aura around them. Now, when that happens, you start to see these synchronicities. And in the beginning, our students say, oh my gosh, look, that happened. You won't believe it. And I was like, whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. And what happens is the higher the vibration. So let's be clear. On a vibrational scale, zero hertz is death. And let's say 700 hertz is enlightenment. Okay. 250 is neutral. 100 is fear. So on and so forth. When you're working your way up the ladder and you're ascending, this is a science of ascension, increasing energy, frequency, and vibration, quality of life, health, wealth, fulfillment, and so on and so forth. When you're doing, when you're working on yourself and you're, and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in your human experience, the energy comes up and becomes more profound and, and more powerful. You attract at that level, like we just talked about. You vibrate at fear, you focus on fear, you attract that fear. You don't want to attack that fear. Okay, you get to neutral, 250, you attract neutral. Who wants to be neutral? Who wants to be mediocre? Okay, maybe someone, but not a lot of people. What about if you could get to love? What if you could get to joy at 540 hertz? What if you could attract from joy? What would your life be like if you would be in joy all the time, like children before they got conditioned? So what happens is when we do what we love and love what we do, people come to us and they say, how, how are you doing this? How are you able to attract all this? Well, I'm not in essence attracting it. The universe is bringing it to me because I am a magnet of conscious creation. Conscious or unconscious. So what happens with synchronicities, if they're good synchronicities, they come into your life and they go, oh my gosh, there it is. They are signs. Just like goosebumps. You know, when someone says something and you get, I call them soul bumps. <laughs> you get soul bumps or a tear of gratitude a tear of joy um, that moment when someone says something and time and space seems to disappear and you're left with nothing but the present moment when your heart skips a beat those moments are not random moments those moments are signs from your soul to listen and what if you could fill your life with moments that took your breath away just by starting to pay attention? What if your life could be filled with those? You would say, whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is over and over and over again, because your soul will show you that you're on path living your life. I love that. I love that. That, oh, that is so inspiring. So what I actually learned in India when I was there at an ashram many years ago, was that when you pay attention to synchronicities, they become miracles. And it's sort of the same, what you're saying, that 
whoop, whoop, we need to start to pay attention to them. <laughs> and that is a sign that we're on our purpose, on the right path or aligned with our deeper truth. I love that. Thank you so much, Esmond. This has been a profound conversation. At the end here, I would love for you to share where can people reach you? How can they work with you? Can you share a little bit about, you know, uh, yeah, how people can get to know more about your work? Sure, sure. Um, go to dresspen.com, which is D-R-E-S-P-E-N.com and have a look and, and, and feel and, and, and see what you resonate with. If you go to dresspen.com, which is D-R-E-S-P-E-N.com forward slash Q-X, the letter Q and the letter X, which is short for the quantum experience, this one, you will be able to join a, a one-day event. Um, it's uh, at the moment we're doing it for free, but soon it's going to be seventeen dollars, and I give one hundred percent of the proceeds to charity, to give water to children, and uh, we remove plastic from the ocean and plant a tree. So people can attend my experiences for free. Uh, well, they pay seventeen dollars. Um, they I don't at all of it. I don't receive anything, but everyone has a vested interest because you get to give. For those who really need it, receive. Um, and I get the opportunity to, to spend a day with you and to teach you these things and for, for each person to go through these experiences for themselves. Um, and we do a lot of uh, closed eye processes where we, where we are, sit and, and feel and, and kind of tap into the unconscious mind and, and sometimes even access the superconscious. And, uh, and we put together the, we, I've been able to bridge the gap between science and spirituality. This has been such a, a war for, for thousands of years where science has said one thing and spirituality has said another. Well, they're one and the same. They're the masculine, the feminine, if you will, but together they are whole. Um, so in the quantum experience, uh, people will be able to attend the free, uh, uh, excuse me, a full day uh, event. And we also teach breath work um, at the end, um, a very powerful breath work technique that I worked on for 15 years now. And the feedback from most people is um, similar to what we call DMT. Um, quite an out-of-body mystical profound experience that can be elicited through one's own breath so go to the website and check it out send us an email if you have any questions oh my goodness i want to be there and um, that you're giving this to charity that that is just so beautiful you're an amazing guy. I, I'm going to be there. And I hope many of you guys will be there as well to have a full day with Espen. Thank you so much, Espen. I was really inspired by this conversation. Thank you so much for being here today and for the work you're doing. It's my absolute privilege. And uh, just a reminder for everyone listening and watching, you, no one else, but you are the hero that you've been waiting for. Take a moment today to look in the mirror and just re remember who you are. And remember that you're alive in the most incredible time in human history and you're here for a reason. So give yourself some credit, give yourself some love. When you wake up tomorrow, start prioritizing yourself and putting yourself first because you are incredible and you are absolutely amazing. And uh, as I say to my students, all of me loves all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And thank you for watching everybody. Much light from Australia and Norway. Bye-bye.